Hello and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the life of Frank W. Abagnale Jr., known by most people through his best-selling autobiography, Catch Me If You Can, and the 2002 movie of the same name, starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks. For the first time on this channel, the narration today has not been researched and written by The Crime Reel. I was recently contacted by Emily Keogh Publicity, who represents the author Alan C. Logan. Alan's book, The Greatest Hoax on Earth, Catching Truth While We Can, has recently been published. Following meticulous research and first-person interviews with Mark Zinder, who was Frank's longtime publicist, and Paula Parks, a former Delta flight attendant. This book examines the true story of Frank's extraordinary claims about his life and his so-called victimless crimes. Alan has been kind enough to use his extensive research to write an overview of Frank's life for me to narrate here on the channel. This narration will catalogue Frank's actual life and crimes which are vastly different from the life story that most people know through his autobiography and the subsequent blockbuster movie, which have recently been proven to be false, revealing that selling a fabricated story to the world may have been his greatest hoax yet. So without further ado, here is Alan's story looking at the life of Frank W. Abagnale Jr. Frank was born on April 27th, 1948, in the Bronx, New York. This is not in the elite Bronxville, as he has claimed. He was the second of four children, born to Frank Abagnale Sr. and his Algerian wartime bride, Paulette Anton Noel, after they met in Europe during the World War II. Frank was described by both parents as a troubled child in need of psychiatric help even before their divorce on January the 20th, 1964, when Frank was 15 years old. His father married again less than three months later to divorcee Lillian May Hecker, a receptionist at a local TV station who was 14 years younger than Frank Sr. His mother later married a local dentist, Joseph Carlucci. Frank Jr. has always claimed that the marital rift played an important influence in his life of crime. Records show Frank was already known to authorities in Westchester, New York, for petty crimes. He had been accused of stealing from several local small businesses, including a dry cleaner. According to his own account, he spent one year between the ages of 15 and 16 in a juvenile home for boys run by Catholic charities. This appears to be true. He then entered the US Navy in late December 1964 at the age of 16. He was discharged from the Navy two months later on February the 18th, 1965. He reoffended within a week of discharge, being arrested for forgery on February the 25th, 1965, in Mount Vernon, New York. Two weeks later, on March the 11th, he was arrested again in the same town, this time for vagrancy. Returned to the community awaiting trial, he went on yet another petty crime spree, stealing from more family businesses and people from the local community, before stealing a yellow Ford Mustang and fleeing to California. He was arrested again several weeks later on the 21st of June 1965 by local authorities in Eureka, California. The case was turned over to federal authorities because driving a stolen car over state lines is a federal offence. His father travelled to California to escort him back to New York to face charges in his home state. Bail was set at just $1 because his father had fallen on hard times. To this day, Frank claims that he never stole from individuals or small businesses, only large corporations. However, records show that this is not true. When he returned to New York, he still had an outstanding arrest warrant 
by the Westchester police for the checks he had cashed against New York businesses for close to $350, which is almost worth $4,000 today. Several weeks later, on the 15th of July 1965, 17-year-old Frank failed to attend his federal court appearance in Manhattan because he had already been arrested by local Westchester police in Tuckahoe, New York. Curiously, when he was arrested retrieving items from a local tailor, he was wearing a pilot's uniform. This is the first documented report that he was impersonating a pilot, but contrary to the story he later popularised that he travelled the world as a teenage millionaire, impersonating an airline pilot for two years, cashing $2 million in cheques in 26 countries, he was instead captured before the ruse had barely begun. He was sent to Comstock Prison in New York for the remainder of his teenage years, three years for forgery against local businesses, which he admitted in a signed affidavit. Two years later, in 1967, at the age of 19, he was released on parole to the care of his mother, who later stated that he was writing bad checks within a week of arriving home. A little over a month after his release, he was arrested in Boston, Massachusetts for grand theft auto and small-time larceny by forgery. He was sentenced to another six months in prison and served 128 days in Boston before he was returned to Comstock Prison in New York for the remainder of the original sentence and for violating his parole. He was eventually released on Christmas Eve 1968 at the age of 20. In summary, Frank was incarcerated for most of his teenage years, making all his later claims the life story that created a billion dollar industry completely impossible. He was in prison the entire time he later claimed to be impersonating a pilot for two years from age 16, a doctor for about a year, age 18, a lawyer from age 19, and two semesters as a professor at age 20. Frank had successfully concealed this real record of petty crime from the world until I revealed the truth for the first time in my true crime book, The Greatest Hoax on Earth, Catching Truth While We Can. I have systematically uncovered the layers of deception that reveal Frank's greatest hoax, that he has been deceiving the world about his past for more than 40 years. Following Frank's release at Christmas 1968, his life of petty crime continued. Now aged 20, he had finally put on the pilot's uniform again and did manage to scam a few free flights on Delta Airlines, dressed as a co-pilot for TWA, Trans World Airlines. This was as part of agreements between airlines to allow the crew to catch a flight if there were open seats. On one of these flights, he met a Delta flight attendant by the name of Paula Parks, and he started following her from location to location to convince her to date him. She spoke publicly for the first time to me about her experiences, describing how she felt stalked and tried to extricate herself from the situation, but not before Frank had met her parents in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and charmed them. Not long after, she went home to nearby New Orleans. Paula was horrified to learn Frank had returned to Baton Rouge and moved in with her parents, taking advantage of their southern hospitality. He inserted himself into the community and local church, posing as a furloughed pilot, trying to get a position working with vulnerable children. During the weeks he was living with the Parks family, he was stealing from them and at least one small business in Baton Rouge. This was discovered within weeks and he was arrested and charged with vagrancy on Valentine's Day 1969. TWA Airlines confirmed they were aware of his antics and had received numerous complaints about a vagrant posing as a pilot over the previous few weeks. And so, the man who has since claimed to have been a millionaire by the time he was 21 actually spent his 21st birthday in jail, penniless and unable to post bail. 
The traumatised Parks family reported that he even had the audacity to call them to ask if they would pay his bail. They refused. As a repeat offender, Frank was anticipating a lengthy sentence, so took advantage of a local reverend who he had befriended to advocate for leniency and psychiatric treatment instead of prison. It worked. He pleaded guilty and on June 17th, 1969, he was sentenced to 12 years for his theft and forgery convictions, but this was to be served on supervised probation. However, Frank soon absconded and was back to his same old tricks. By the time the judge in Baton Rouge ordered a formal bench warrant, Frank had already stolen at least two more cars and cashed a few bad checks, this time in Sweden and France, again targeting trusting locals and small business. He was apprehended within weeks, arrested in France in September 1969 and charged with theft and swindling. He was sentenced to just four months in Perpignan prison but served only three. He was then extradited to Sweden to face charges of gross fraud by forgery and ultimately was sentenced to two months in Malmo jail. Witnesses say there is no evidence that he was emaciated after his confinement in France, contradicting his claims that he was starved during his time in a French prison and was only £109 when he left. On release from Malmo jail, he was deported to the United States of America with an eight-year ban from re-entering Sweden. He was ordered to pay restitution, but his Swedish victims recently claimed they have never received a single krona from him. Frank himself and those who promoted the film in 2002 claimed that he was on the most wanted lists of Interpol and the FBI. This is false and Frank has recently refrained from making this claim. However, he has recently stated that he was celebrated in the FBI's big 100th anniversary coffee table book. That book is real but he is not even mentioned within its pages. There was also no years long cat and mouse chase with the FBI as his autobiography and movie suggests. His long standing claims that he was extradited from Europe in custody and made national headlines for escaping through an airline toilet are also false. More recently in his Talks at Google, which has now been viewed over 11 million times on YouTube, he has claimed that Steven Spielberg was the one who conjured up the airliner toilet escape. In fact, at 22 years old, he was largely unknown. He returned to the United States from Sweden around June 1970, with no media reports on record at all. Shortly after, at the end of July 1970, the 22-year-old ran a small scam that proved to be the basis of the Hollywood film that depicted it as happening when he was 16 years old. Frank dressed up personal checks with a Pan Am logo and cashed them. However, federal court records show the grand total was just $1,448.60 over 12 weeks nowhere near the grossly exaggerated claim of stealing $2.5 million. His arrest record shows there were just 10 checks in total, not the 17,000 checks as he later claimed. He was apprehended fairly quickly on the 2nd of November 1970 in Cobb County, Georgia, because he used his own name on the checks. While awaiting his federal trial in the Cobb County Jail, he did escape, but he was only at large for a few days before being caught in New York City while trying to cash another Pan Am check. He was held in jail in New York for six weeks before being delivered back to Atlanta on March 30th, 1971. The following month, on April 29th, 1971, he pleaded guilty to all charges and was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison in Petersburg, Virginia, with an additional two years for the escape. He has publicly admitted to this federal sentence, but misrepresented and exaggerated his crimes. 
He has also falsely claimed he was housed in Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, one of the most secure prisons in the United States, and that he escaped. In reality, he was not even there. Frank also claims that he was released as a reformed man, but this did not prove to be the case either. When he was paroled to Houston, Texas, under supervised probation in 1973 at the age of 25, he was once again arrested, this time for stealing from a children's camp near Houston. Pretending to be a furloughed Delta pilot, he had found a position as a bus driver and camp counsellor at a children's summer camp. He was caught stealing from the camp and another counsellor who he had befriended. He was arrested in Friendswood, Texas on August 29th, 1974. He was aged 26 at the time, a far cry from his later claims that all his crimes were committed as a teenager. Again, Frank appeared to fall on his feet when a lenient judge ruled that he had to pay restitution for the stolen goods. He had a girlfriend at the time who appeared to have helped repay the victims on this occasion and he remained in the Houston area. Not long after, according to his parole officer, Jim Blackmon, Frank used false pretenses and falsified records to get a job working at a Houston children's home, placing vulnerable children in foster homes. When the parole officer discovered this, he said he ordered Frank to resign and suggested that Frank moved into his garage apartment so that he could keep a closer eye on his clients. At the age of 27, in 1975, Frank finally appeared to get a legitimate job with one of the largest companies in the United States, Aetner Life and Casualty. But again, temptation was too great for him. The company ended up suing him for check fraud. Aetner may have been a $5 billion company at the time, but they were not prepared to let the $200 crime go unpunished. Fortunately for Frank, Aitner decided not to pursue criminal charges. Around this time, he met a Houston woman, Kelly Welbs, spelt W-E-L-B-E-S, and he finally started to turn his life around. A few months later, in April 1976, he registered his own company, Frank W. Abagnale and Associates. The couple married on November 3, 1976, and Frank started holding anti-crime seminars based on his newly minted persona of reformed criminal. With a natural gift for persuasion and storytelling, he caught the eye of several powerful individuals who helped market and amplify the story, including marketing giant Leo Langlois, who helped market the NASA space program, and also Houston Chronicle journalist Stan Redding, who would later help rewrite Frank's life story as co-author of Catch Me If You Can. The story was reconstructed with complete fabrications and gross exaggerations, carefully romanticised to play on audience heartstrings and glamorised with fairy tale flair for wide appeal. Frank was recast as a teenager to make audiences more sympathetic to his deliberately embellished crimes and his largely fictional cons, when in reality his small Pan Am check fraud scheme and many other crimes were as an adult. Even today, Frank continues to use his youth as an excuse, claiming he would never have done it if he was an adult. His story was an overnight success after his appearance on the hit game show To Tell the Truth in the spring of 1977. That episode, now on YouTube, has been viewed over one million times. This was followed by appearances on The Today Show and Johnny Carson's Tonight Show, which drew enormous national fame. The book, Catch Me If You Can, was an instant New York Times bestseller. It was the basis of the 2002 Hollywood blockbuster and a billion dollar enterprise, including a Broadway play. When the story first appeared, not everyone was fooled. Several skeptical journalists investigated the claims 
and found them to be unsubstantiated. They contacted locals where Frank had claimed to have impersonated a lawyer, doctor and professor and were met with denials in every case. But without the evidence of where he really was, now known to be Comstock Prison, and without the reach of the internet, these local reports were largely unnoticed and ignored. The voices of victims who did call the media to protest were drowned out by the overwhelming power of the story and its fictional hero. The first assistant attorney general at the time, Ken DeGene, contacted the National Enquirer when he heard that they were planning to run a story on Frank. Ken DeGene gave them a set of questions to ask Frank to check the validity of his story. These were, what did the Attorney General look like? How old was he? How tall was he? What floor was the office on? What did it look like? Frank failed to answer even one of these questions correctly and the National Enquirer never ran the story. However, other publications and media outlets continued to perpetuate and reinforce the fictional version of events created by Frank. Even with his dramatic fame and change in fortune, Frank was still facing numerous lawsuits for unpaid promissory notes after his book was released in the 1980s, including from people he had convinced to invest in his business. Even Langlois Communications, who was involved in marketing his fabricated life story, filed a civil lawsuit against Frank, suing for their creative intellectual property, although the details of the rift are not clear from the court documents. But the story remained unquestioned, and the fiction was repeated so many times as fact through the media, it was assumed to be true. It has even made his way into academic textbooks without serious efforts to verify the claims of the self-proclaimed con man. Today the con has a life of its own. Dozens and dozens of YouTube videos claim to present the true story of Catch Me If You Can, only to repeat the claims of Frank, a self-proclaimed con man. Perhaps Frank's most remarkable achievement yet is reaching the stage of talks at Google in 2017, renowned as a source of truth and fact-checking in which he tells numerous lies throughout, most notably that he was arrested only once in his life. Over 40 years after the con began, Frank is still on lucrative speaking tours with a new generation of admirers. His Talks at Google lecture has been viewed over 11 million times on YouTube to great applause and adoration for a man who says his victimless crimes targeted only hotels, banks and airlines. He is also revered as an ambassador for the AARP, the American Association of Retired Persons, who advise the elderly and the retired and protect them from fraudsters like himself. It is only in 2021 that Frank's greatest hoax has been exposed, that he has been conning the public for almost 45 years. Whilst researching another great con man, Dr. Robert Spears, who has a bona fide resume as a great imposter, I noticed a number of comparisons being made to the life of Frank Abagnale, and so my extensive research began. I soon discovered that few of Frank's claims are true, Remarkably, as the curtain of deception is pulled back, it seems stunning how easily Frank was able to convince the world and how willing we have been to take the word of a con man. Full details of my findings can be found in my critically acclaimed book, The Greatest Hoax on Earth, in which I have used a diverse trail of meticulous research forensically collected from public records, arrest reports, court witnesses, National Archives file statements, local reporting and even secret, never before seen letters that reveal Frank as a very troubled young man who is very far from being a criminal mastermind. These records ultimately prove he was in prison for almost the entire period he claimed to be travelling the world as an imposter. I have also included first-hand accounts from Frank's former manager Mark Zinder, who was his constant companion during the 1980s heyday of Frank's celebrity and success. To this day, 
Frank continues to tell essentially the same story, collecting generous speaking fees the world over. My book also shows how Frank has changed his story over the years, shifting his narrative when occasionally challenged, or to adapt to cultural changes. While few seem to have noticed this, I have obtained early recordings and documents which captured the con man in his own words, especially in the early days of the development of his autobiography in the late 1970s. My investigation confirms that Frank's actual criminal history, while extensive, does not bear any resemblance to his Catch Me If You Can narrative. It is largely the record of a small-time thief caught stealing from both individuals and small businesses over a decade, with multiple prison sentences for these crimes. In April of 2021, the national media outlet NPR, November Papa Romeo, ran a story on these revelations and the newly uncovered evidence. They contacted Frank, who declined to comment. There is no doubt that Frank W. Abagnale Jr. has made up most of his crimes and benefited enormously from this. Selling fact as fiction, he has found his greatest mark in global audiences and the world happily bought it. This may have actually earned him the title of the world's greatest con man. So that ends today's narration and I would like to say a massive thank you to the author Alan C. Logan for providing this for us. Also a big thank you to Emily Keogh for facilitating this collaboration. If anyone is interested in purchasing Alan's book, I will leave a link in a post in the comments below and in the description. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts and feedback on this case. Thank you for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst, have you ever told a lie? And from there, it escalated really quickly. Goodbye.